It's The Real News Network, and I'm Greg Wilpert, joining you from Baltimore. Brazilians almost elected Jair Bolsonaro, a far-right extremist, some would say a neo-fascist, as their president on Sunday. He barely missed the 50% mark, coming in at 46% of the vote. The other candidate, who will face Bolsonaro in a runoff on October 28th, is Fernando Haddad. Haddad replaced former President Lula da Silva as the Workers' Party candidate a few weeks ago and came in with 29% of the vote on Sunday. It now remains to be seen how many of the other 11 candidates who are running for president will endorse Haddad in order to try and prevent a Bolsonaro presidency. Joining me now to discuss Brazil's election results is Brian Mir. Brian is an editor for the website Brazil Wire and is also editor of the book Voices of the Brazilian Left. He joins us from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Thanks for being here again, Brian. Thanks, Greg. How are you? Pretty good. So it seems that uh, this result was even worse than most people feared. The last opinion polls before the election had indicated that Bolsonaro had about 35 percent support, but he came in well above this. What happened? How do you explain this result? Well, um, Bolsonaro hasn't been campaigning on television. He hasn't been participating in the debates. His entire strategy is based on social media, and he has support in this by Steve Bannon. And so what we see is a very similar situation to the Brexit and Trump's victory, where the polls were wrong because there was a last-minute bombardment of fake information and slander over the social media. In this case, uh, What's Up, which is a Facebook product, which is very popular in Brazil. Brazil is the largest user of what's up in the world. Over half the Brazilian population uses it. And so you have these what's up groups, thousands and thousands of groups called the myth about Bolsonaro, each one going to 256 people. So there's a very, it's very difficult to um, audit, uh, to, you know, to find out who's behind the slander, but they spread they targeted the evangelical community, which is about 30% of the Brazilian population, with a bombardment of lies about things like, if, the, if Haddad is elected, the government's gonna start forcing children to become homosexuals. They spread a fake Photoshop photo of uh, Manuela Davila, the vice presidential candidate, with a T-shirt that said, Jesus is a transvestite on it. And they just bombarded people with these messages. And so it caused this surge, but they failed in their main objective, which was to win in the first round at least. And so now there's three weeks to regroup. And if Bolsonaro keeps avoiding debates, he's a very poor debater, it's gonna damage his image and credibility with voters. And hopefully this coupled with other candidates' support for Haddad will be enough to push Haddad over the top and avoid Brazil basically transforming into a fascist, neo-fascist country as it was during the military dictatorship from 1964 to 1985, a dictatorship that Bolsonaro was part of, that his vice president, who is a general, General Moran, was a main actor in. Wow. So who is backing Bolsonaro and why? I mean. Uh, he's, uh, he seems like he came out of nowhere, but actually, I mean, he's been a, a member of Congress for a long time, uh, but he seems to have gathered a lot of support very recently. Where is that support coming from? Well, um, you know, yeah, it's true. He's been a congressman for 28 years. During this 28 years, he only passed two laws. So he's been ineffectual as a congressman. The New York Times ran a fluff piece praising him in 1993. Uh, there's a corporate think tank supported by all the major players in the oil industry and Monsanto and other big American companies uh, called ASCOA, America Society Council of the Americas, which was founded by the Rockefellers in the 1960s and has supported every, almost every coup in Latin America since. They flew up Bolsonaro a few months ago for a secret meeting with American business leaders. And then their editor, Brian Winter, published an article in Folio do São Paulo, uh, the biggest newspaper in Brazil, a few weeks ago, saying why Wall Street is rooting for Bolsonaro. Well, the reason Wall Street is apparently rooting for Bolsonaro is because his finance advisor, uh, Guedes, Beto Guedes, was a member of the Pinochet economic team. He's a University of Chicago-educated neoliberal economist who's promising to privatize everything to keep handing Brazil's natural resources over 
to foreign corporations, which is the tendency that basically started after the 2016 coup. So tell us some more about uh, some of the other re election results. Uh, Brazilians not only voted for president, but also for Congress, governors and state legislatures last Sunday. Was there a pronounced rightward shift in these other races as well? Or was it mostly limited to the presidency? Um, the, it's, the results are pretty interesting. The PT party took some losses. They went down from 61 to 56 congressmen, but they're still the largest bloc in Congress. And uh, basically, it was the northeast of Brazil that kept the right from winning in the first round. Uh, most of the governors in the northeast are from left parties. A lot of left victories in the northeastern states, which is the traditional poorest part of Brazil, traditionally more progressive. Um, but at the same time, the traditional parties, the parties that orchestrated the 2016 coup and planned on benefiting from it, like the PSDB party, which has made the final round in every presidential election since 1994, they got pummeled. Their candidate, who was Wall Street's first choice in this election, ended up with only about 5% of the vote. Uh, and you know they were the main alternative to the PT for 25 years in Brazil. And they took losses all over the place. The PMDB party of Michel Temer took major losses as well. So in the one sense, uh, it's blowback. The people are angry at them for throwing out Dilma Rousseff. But at the same time, the party that gained the most is this tiny far right wing party with fascist tendencies that's homophobic, that believes in arming, uh, letting the police kill whoever they want, etc. You know, the PSL, they gained a lot of seats. So I just want to turn now to uh, the voting process itself. Uh, there have been some who complained uh, that uh, there might have been some fraud uh, or even accused uh, the process of uh, being fraudulent at some level. Also, I want to wonder now, uh, first of all, what you think of that? And secondly, also, how was turnout compared to previous elections? Okay, well, as regarding fraud, this is mainly Bolsonaro say, well, Bolsonaro has been saying that if he doesn't win, he doesn't recognize the results because he's accusing the process of being fraudulent in advance. OK, so he's complaining now of fraud because he didn't win in the first round. And he's announced that he's not going to accept the results at the end of this month if he doesn't win. But there's been plenty of institutional fraud. For example, the fact that Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, who was the front runner predicted to win in the first round, was not allowed to run for office is fraud in itself because the electoral courts allowed 1,400 other candidates with identical legal situations to Lula's. In other words, they're waiting for the appeals process to play out in some kind of charges against them. They were allowed to run. And some candidates with much more serious legal problems than Lula were allowed to run, like gubernatorial candidate Anthony Garocino in, in Rio, who's been in jail twice, you know? Um, so that's fraud. And then they removed 3 million voters from the ballots, uh, for, no, from the registry uh, the week before the elections because they said their biometric information was wrong. And most of these voters were in the poor Northeast, which is the same region that prevented a Bolsonaro victory. So apparently that's 3 million voters who most of whom would have voted for Haddad, you know, and then I mean, I could go on and on, really, if you want to talk about irregularities in this election. But those are a few prime examples. I think that's very important because that hardly gets out at all. So what will happen now? Uh, will the other candidates endorse Haddad in order to prevent a Bolsonaro presidency, kind of like what happened in France when the choice was between the neoliberal Macron and the far right Le Pen? Well, uh, what happened was interesting in a bad way, you know, <laughs> bad interesting is that most of the other candidates uh, lost all of their support to Bolsonaro already, especially in the center and the center right. For example, Marina Silva, who had something like 16 percent in the last presidential elections, she ended up with one percent of the vote and all of her voters went to Bolsonaro. And Geraldo Alckman from PSEB, who was predicted to be a possible winner, he ended up with 5%. He lost most of his votes to Bolsonaro. But what we do have is Ciro Gomez, the third place candidate who ended up with 12%. He's going to support Haddad. 
So we can expect at least a base of 40, 41% for Haddad. And then the other big uh, factor in the election are the undecideds or the people who cast blank ballots or didn't vote, which was almost 30% in this election, roughly comparable to the last election. But in the case of this menace of fascism returning to Brazil, remembering that we're in a country that has 53% Afro-Brazilian population, where the front runner is openly racist against black people, uh, hopefully uh, more people will leave the ranks of the undecided or the apathetic and side with Haddad, and that will be enough to push him through. But it's going to be a tough fight because we're not just fighting against uh, Bolsonaro and his party, we're fighting against Wall Street interests and we're fighting against Steve Bannon. Yeah. Well, we're going to leave it there for now, but we'd love to have you back on uh, as we get closer to the uh, October 28th runoff vote. I'm speaking to Brian Meir, editor of the website Brazil Wire. Thanks again, Brian, for having joined us today. Thanks, Greg. And thank you for joining the Real News Network.